Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Uh, welcome back to the Investing Summit here at Hedge Eye, where it's my pleasure to welcome back Jim Rickards, one of my favorite guys, and actually the only guy who agrees with me on long-term bonds right now. I think I've had to uh, sustain, I guess, right, Ben? Because he sees the queue every day. We do this morning, as you know, this morning macro show. Mm -hmm. And the queue of anxiety associated with, and we like literally just went bullish on bonds for the first time in long-term bonds, treasury bonds, yep. for the first time in two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Like, as you know, I go both ways. Sometimes I'll stay longer with it, sometimes not. But, right. but the amount of pain in like two weeks that all of a sudden feels like even in our user base, it was, it's palatable. Yeah. And it's, um, I want to start with kind of, not, not, not you agreeing with me, obviously, because you come at things from a, a longer term perspective. I want to just get your, your, your view of this, this, this angst, like uh, in, in rate space. Uh, it's really, first of all, you're exactly right in your description, Keith. And uh, yeah, I'm, you're, you're more technically oriented, I'm more global macro, but we're coming out in the same place in this. Uh, yeah, I look at 10-year treasury, I look at the 10-year more than the 30-year bond, but I agree right. with you on the bond. But 10-year treasury is at, you know, 325 or wherever they are, you know, yield to maturity. Shoot them in, because... Uh, <laughs> Shoot them in. <laughs> no, but it's fine, because uh, but here's the thing. I was like, oh, rates have gone up, and uh, it was 2.5, now it's 3.5, and massive move, and the... the, 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 the uh, uh, the bull market's over, the 37-year bull market's over, and you got, um, you know, smart guys, Bill Gross, Jeff Gunlack, and all this, the bear market's here and all that. Nonsense. Here, and here's why. Um, I was in the bond business for decades before I became a writer and started doing more research and analytics and all that. And um, I was around when the, bond, when the bull market started in 1981. Mm -hmm. And you just, rode the, you just rode that bull market for, as I say, 30 years. Well, there are guys who... We're trading bonds when uh, they were, you know, yielding 15 percent. You know, <laughs> good for you if you bought a 1982 30-year note yielding 15 percent and redeemed it in in 2000, uh, 2012. But um, they just can't get their minds around 2 percent interest rates, 3 percent interest rates. To say, well, interest rates are really low. They're actually not low. They're low in nominal space, mm -hmm. but they're not low in real space. Right. What people forget is when the yield was. 13%, inflation was 15%. So the, um, you actually had a, um, uh, a negative yield on that. Uh, but today, uh, real rates are going up. That's what I watch. I don't mm -hmm. watch, yeah, you look at nominal rates, it's important for trading and a lot of other things. But uh, if you want to do predictive analytics, you have to look at real rates. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have to look at what's predictive of real rates, which right. is the growth rates of inflation and, and growth itself on a real basis. Correct. So, I mean, that not that a big part of where you're at is that you don't think that this run in growth is going to continue from here? Yeah, we'll talk about that. But yeah. no, I, I don't think they're running growth. This is like a little pop from the tax cuts. Uh, completely predictable, uh, and it's going to run out of steam. You know, uh, so what happened in January 2018? Uh, they cut taxes, mostly corporate taxes, a little yep. bit on the individual side. This was a gift to corporate America. Yep. So uh, LLCs, baby. Yeah, LLCs <laughs> and, uh, and and the big corporations, and certainly the multinational corporations with the offshore earnings, they get a gift. So um, so then what happens next? Well, uh, they use the, the the notion was well, they're going to take the money and invest in plant and equipment and uh, mm -hmm. create all these jobs, all this infrastructure and, and all that. They didn't. They're using it for stock buybacks. First of all, a lot of the money is still offshore, mm -hmm. uh, number one, except that offshore money is not offshore because they invested in the United States. That's what people didn't get. Gary Collins on TV you know, a, a year ago saying, well, pass this tax cut. There'll be a wave of trillions of dollars of cash coming back to the United States. It's like, he knew better. The money's already here. It was always here. A Dublin corporation did not have Pay, you know, uh, paper uh, dollar bills in, in the uh, basement of a vault in Dublin. <laughs> that money was in U.S. treasuries and U.S. corporates, yeah. which is perfectly legal. An offshore subsidiary can invest in the United States without paying U.S. taxes. It's only if you do business here that you're subject to U.S. taxes. So all the money was in U.S. markets, number one. So it didn't come back. It was already here. Uh, number two, you think if Apple wanted to build a fabrication plant in the United States three years ago, they couldn't have borrowed the money at one and a half percent and built all the plant they wanted, yeah, and if it pledged the offshore cash collateral if you have to, which they didn't. So the fact that it was offshore never stood in the way of uh, plant and equipment investment. Uh, it was already in U.S. markets. So the whole thing was a gift to corporations. So they used it for stock buybacks, which reduced the number of shares. So the earnings per share go up. Earnings per share went up, not because earnings went up is because the shares went down. It's just simple, you know, it's, it's eighth grade math. So you do get this, you did get this, uh, you know, bull market run uh, in the middle and, and, and the second half of the year. But they're not going to cut taxes again in January. January 2019, we're not going to have another tax cut. 
stock market's on its own. Oh, you mean you have to report those growth rates against the prior period? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And uh, so, um, yeah, so it's it's a pop. Uh, it's it's Wall Street at its finest, but it's it's not going to be replicated. It's not sustainable, and we're going to mm. be back to the same you know 2.2 percent growth we had under Obama. And by the way. During the, the eight years of Obama, there were multiple four uh, four four percent back to back quarters. We mm -hmm. had two two occasions where growth was over four percent back to back, but then it goes down to two percent or it goes down one one quarter went negative. So the pattern of yeah you, know, you get decent growth but it falls off a cliff has been repeated so many times in the last eight years that to me the burden of proof is on the bulls. You have yeah. to, you have to show me why this is sustainable. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, if um, just thinking of what chart number it is, I think it's slide 13 or 14, guys. Like our GDP, our GDP now cast, which is not an opinion, it's just what the data is coming in against, right. against the prior reported data, which is the most important point that you made that people need to understand. Right. Like in the uh, third quarter, as you can see there, it's 305 on a year over year basis. But what that really imputes, like if any slowdown in the fourth quarter, we have it going to you know, basically 25 basis point drop. Right. If you go to the next slide, slide 14, the way that Wall Street looks at that, which is sequential, Trump's 4% is gonna go to 3%, then it's gonna go to 1%. Right. One, okay? That's exactly right. Now that's, that, that is number one, why we're having like, at least we call it a quad four event, because yep. growth is and rate of change space actually slowing. Mm -hmm. And most people say, well, what is the certainty associated with that? The only thing I'm certain of is that we had tax reform last year. Right. And you have to compare against it. Right. And the rest of the world's slowing. So tell me more. Tell me more about this. Um, what is the biggest risk? Like, is there something that you're looking at? Is it the midterms or anything that could really turn that fourth quarter negative against what you already have to be incrementally positive against to begin with? Yeah, you know, the market, uh, for all the flaws in the models, the central banks and all that, and economic forecasters, the market does a fairly good job of getting these things right. And, uh, you know, you look at the uh, fourth quarter, they're already discounting Democrats taking the House of Representatives. Right. So that, uh, by the way, I'm not so sure that's going to happen. I'm leaning to saying the Republicans will hold. I'm not, I'm not ready to put a stake in the ground yet, but I'm getting closer to that point. Mm, really? But that's not what the market thinks. The market thinks the Democrats no, are going to take No, but you've made these calls before, and they've been dead on. Yeah, and so I, uh, <laughs> I want to I wanna be... Let this, me know. This, this one's a lot closer. Well, it'll be on Twitter or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, this one's closer, so I don't want to be as category. Trump was an easy one, and it was clear that Trump yeah. was going to win. Um, Brexit was an easy one. You know, I, I was in London the week before Brexit, and I talked to every taxi driver, shopkeeper, you know, pub uh, uh, owner, etc. I couldn't, I couldn't find a person who didn't want to leave the EU. I couldn't find that. <laughs> now I knew, now I knew the the guys in the city were betting ten thousand uh, pounds that uh, that that they would vote to remain. But uh, that was, that's a very small number of yeah. votes. See, you can skew the betting by making big bets, but you only get one vote. You, know, mm -hmm. you, you don't get 10,000 votes just because you made a 10,000 yeah. pound bet. I, and so, so those were easy ones. Um, this one's closer. You just got to be honest about the fact it's close. But the market certainly thinks the Democrats are going to take it. So that means yeah. endless investigations, impeachment proceedings. You know, it's uh, Nancy Pelosi. We all know what that scenario is. So if, uh, if the Republicans hold, uh, and I think this is going to be very close. Um, that's um, you know that's that's good for the Trump administration. It's good for Trump policies. The history is that actually markets don't really care that much. That, that it's uh, what what markets hate, as you know, Keith, is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So right now we have uncertainty because it's kind of close. When the election's over, the market might get a little blip on that just because it's over, not mm -hmm. because of who won. But beyond that, you're back to the real world and uh, back to the kinds of things we were talking about. Uh, the biggest thing I'm concerned about is uh, I watch the debt to GDP ratio very closely. Mm -hmm. And um, you, uh, there's very good evidence, and this is, this is Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt, although Carmen Reinhardt, I mean, they're both brilliant, but uh, she's done a lot of work on her own with other colleagues pursuing this. And they, what they show is that uh, you know, the Keynesian view is that if the economy's not going fast enough, if you're in a liquidity trap, people won't spend, the government should spend, and there's your liquidity and you'll get some growth. Um, Keynes called it the general theory. I think he was trying to piggyback on Einstein a little bit. Uh, but it's actually a special theory. If it has any, and I'm, a, I'm an admirer of John Maynard Keynes. I'm not an admirer of Keynesianism, which is, has nothing to do with John Maynard Keynes. That's like Paul. They just blame him. That's Paul Samuelson and all these, all these sort of quants in the 1950s. But, but Keynes himself was extremely pragmatic and mm -hmm. brilliant, but also pragmatic. That's what I liked about him. But um, so he he had this theory of you know the government substitutes for a private market illiquidity. Um, if it works at all, and I'm 
little skeptical, but if it works at all, it works on, under a set of conditions. You don't have that much debt to begin with. Mm -hmm. You're actually in a liquidity trap. You're in a recession or you just barely came out of one. Uh, and as I say, you have the borrowing power and you're smart about how you spend the money. Mm -hmm. If you get those four things right, it might give you a little boost. We have none of those conditions today. <laughs> we, have a, we have an enormous debt to GD, uh, GDP ratio. We're in the ninth year of an expansion. Who gooses the economy in the ninth year of an expansion? Um, and we're not smart about how we spend the money. Uh, and there's plenty of liquidity around. So, so we don't really have the, the conditions that, that Keynes was looking at in the, uh, in the 1930s. And you have the modern monetary theorists, you know, our friends uh, mm -hmm. Stephanie Kelton and, and uh, Paul McCauley, and uh, nice people, but they've got this idea that the more you borrow, the better. Yeah. Because when, when the government borrows money, they spend it. And when they spend it, they put it in your pocket or my pocket or some bank account somewhere, and that's the money that stimulates the economy. That, that's true right up until the moment everyone changes their mind. And the, the, one, thing that central bank <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that central bankers do not understand and that modern monetary theorists do not understand is the importance of confidence. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I look at various forms of money, and you know, whether there's Bitcoin, or I consider gold money, I don't consider it a commodity, I consider it money, dollars, you know, sterling, euros, whatever. Um, and people like to say, well, there's nothing backing it up. There's nothing backing up a Bitcoin, there's nothing backing up a dollar or a euro or whatever. And I say, no, you're wrong. There is one thing backing it up, which is confidence. Mm -hmm. If you think it's money, and I think it's money, and you're willing to take it from me in exchange for goods and services, and you think someone else will take it from you, then it works. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it could be feathers, clamshells, beads, or anything else. Mm -hmm. It's when, but confidence is very fragile. You can lose it just like that. And when that happens, it's not money anymore, and that can right. happen overnight. And that's, that's what they're missing. But, but getting back to, to uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt, they show that uh, you know, kind of at the 30% debt to GDP level, maybe mm -hmm. the debt helps a little bit of growth. Uh, Merkel's draws a line of sixty percent. That's the uh, that's the um, uh, the target for all of Europe. Now, not everyone meets it, but mm -hmm. she's pushing everyone to get to sixty percent debt to GDP. What what Reinhardt and uh, Rogoff show is that at ninety percent, you're through the looking glass. Right. Below above ninety percent, you're actually retarding growth. Mm -hmm. You're hurting growth. You, you not only do you not get a dollar of growth for a dollar of debt, you don't even get a dollar. You yep. get 50 cents. Right. So, uh, so as that ratio goes up, the economy gets worse. It's, it's just simple diminishing mm -hmm. marginal returns. You know, yep. Any engineer, you know, uh, first year economics student understands that. So we're, we're at 105%, mm -hmm. and we're heading north. Uh, because uh, So this tax cut, the Trump tax cut, throws a $1.4 trillion deficit on top of the deficit we already had. Exactly. This stuff, you know, I, I know Art Laffer very well, nice guy, but the whole Laffer curve thing. It doesn't work at these levels. I mean, maybe if you had 100% taxation, it would work a little bit, but um, no one's ever, the Laffer curve is an interesting theory, but no one's ever specified the shape of the Laffer curve. <laughs> so Art, Art will do it on that. It works it. when it's working. It works, it works when, it, when it's working. When growth but, is accelerating, it's working. Yeah, but it doesn't work now, and that's, that's the point. So, so Steve Moore, Cudlow, Steve Forbes, Art Laffer, all these guys, um, they're reliving the Reagan playbook. Uh, and we did have very strong growth after, well, after the worst recession since, we're, since the Great Depression. We had strong growth. I would have forecast strong growth anyway. I mean, you're going to get strong yeah. growth after a normal cyclical recession like that. But they got it, and they said this validates the Reagan tax cuts, validates the Laffer curve, et cetera. So they're chanting that playbook again in a completely different world, where the, Ronald Reagan had the lowest debt to GDP ratio since Herbert Hoover, mm -hmm. uh, or, or Calvin Coolidge, rather, uh, since the 1920s. So he had headroom, and he took, Reagan was a big spender. Reagan took the debt to GDP from 30% to 50%, mm -hmm. which is a 60% increase. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that worked. And then Bush 41 and Clinton, uh, who had a lot more in common than people imagine, kept a lid on it. Uh, and then Bush 43 blew it out, and then Obama doubled it. Mm -hmm. So now we're at 105%. So these are not, uh, these are conditions conducive to slower growth. Uh, loss of confidence, and uh, that's that's what we'll be seeing uh, sooner than later. Yeah, these um, we call them the five structural pillars of risk. Mm -hmm. They never went away. Right. It's just the causal factor can mask them, which mm -hmm. is when growth is accelerating. Those again, okay, debt to GDP. Actually, in this case, it didn't go down, um, right. but usually it goes down. Right. Obviously, because your GDP is surprising to the upside. Right. But once you get that, plus Reinhardt and Rogoff did this too. Once you get to 10%, 9%, 10% uh, deficit to GDP, right. on top of that, That's right. you're really screwed. Yeah. And look at the countries this year, Jim, that are ex completely screwed. You don't need to look for evidence 
of the next crisis. If you have growth slowing, one, and twin deficits, two. Right. That's a pretty simple one, right? right? And you have debt out the wazoo. Let's add three, yeah. your metric. You, you are Turkey, you are South Africa, you are uh, Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, you are Venezuela. You, these declines have, in their currency and equity markets have been epic. You know, so I wonder why people think it is different this time uh, if we get on the backside of a growth curve. Well, when you say people, I mean, I think uh, Americans, yeah, because so the stock market is going up. Now, the interesting thing about the stock market. Well, their markets were going up too up until January. Yeah. Like well, big time. Yeah, and now they're, they've all sort of had to, uh, you know, do south. I mean, they've, they've all crashed. Yeah. Indonesia, uh, Turkey, you know, yeah. the, the countries you mentioned. The currency crash countries are countries that have deficits. Right, right. Uh, but, but, you know, but obviously, obviously deficit and debt to GDP are, are, are connected. But, um, and I like to think about things in real space, mm -hmm. but debt to GDP is a nominal concept. So that's mm -hmm. one of the ones we have to flip back to nominal space. Mm -hmm. Well, because it's a prevailing condition. You you have this condition. Right. If I owe you a dollar, I owe you a dollar. Right. Whether we had inflation and it's worth ten cents, or we had deflation and it's worth two bucks, right. it doesn't matter. I owe you a dollar, so you can't think about it in nominal space. Now, if you get a deficit of four percent, five percent, and nominal growth is three or four percent, mm -hmm. let's, let's let's just put nominal growth at five percent. You know, three plus two is kind of thing. But if the deficit's eight, nine, which it is, it's mm -hmm. going to those levels and it's actually going higher, it, it doesn't matter. Your debt to GDP is going up. Growth looks good, but the debt's growing faster in nominal space. Mm -hmm. And that's deadly. That's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so I mentioned the, the Trump uh, tax cuts. That's, that's the big one. But then, of course, in January, the Congress got rid of uh, the sequester. Mm. So, uh, you know, so the Republicans oh wanted more money for defense. And the Democrats wanted more money for domestic priorities, so the compromise was do both. And so they, <laughs> so they, they removed both caps. Yeah. So that's another three hundred billion on top. And the real, you know, kind of eight hundred pound gorilla in the room that nobody talks about are student loans. Mm -hmm. Now, student loans are one point six trillion dollars uh, and growing rapidly. It's not like they've capped out. Over ninety percent of those are guaranteed by the U.S. Treasury. Mm -hmm. It's one point six trillion dollars of contingent liabilities on top of the $21 yep. trillion dollars in national debt. And um, the problem there, the way it works is, the banks make the loans. The Treasury doesn't, the treasury doesn't make the loans. Uh, so the banks make the loans. The Treasury guarantees them. They back stuff. You have servicing companies and all that, so it's all good. But when they default, the bank calls the Treasury and says, "Take my here's, here's my loan file, pay me. <laughs> and they do, and the Treasury pays them, and they hand over the loan file, and the Treasury keeps the servicer, and, and uh, you go on from there. The default rates are approaching 20%. Now, go back to 2007, why was everyone screaming, well, mortgage rate, mortgage default rates are going to hit 5%, you know? That was like uh, unheard of, and mortgage default rates usually 2 3%, 4%, mm. they were going to hit 5%, and oh my goodness. $1 trillion of um, uh, subprime and all-day loans approaching 5%, that was enough to cause a global financial panic. Here you have $1.6 trillion of student loans um, with default rates approaching 20%. Um, and so far, it's been off budget because it's a contingent. When the it's not balance sheet. Right correct. Now. When the Treasury guarantees it, it's off budget. I so see you don't need congressional appropriations or any of that. But now that the Treasury is starting to write the checks, that number is getting up to $200 billion a year. So throw 300 for the sequester caps, $200 billion for student loans, uh, $1.4 trillion for tax cuts. And that's a conservative estimate. Mm -hmm. That $1.4 trillion uh, of uh, expense from the tax cut, that assumes no recession for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. I mean, come on. <laughs> no slowdown, no recession. No, no slowdown, no recession, exactly. Uh, and also, this 4% growth, you can just extrapolate yeah. that. And I think that's a, it's a very short-term phenomenon. So all, the, all the, 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 the deck is stacked in favor of much higher debt to GDP ratios. We're not that far behind Italy. Mm -hmm. Everyone's up and out in Italian. Uh, you know, uh, 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 benchmark uh, bonds, yields maturity 7%. I was going to say bar the Italians. But, um, but the point is, uh, we're not that far behind Italy. And the mm -hmm. only countries in the world that are worse are Japan and Greece. Mm -hmm. Now, I think most people think of Japan. Japan is like everyone's in the same lifeboat, so don't rock the boat. You know, so let's all pretend it's all good. But, uh, but U.S. debt, I think about, well, I know about 17 or 18 percent of the U.S. debt is held by foreign countries, mostly mm -hmm. China, Taiwan, Japan, and a few other countries. They can change their minds, or they can change the maturity structure, which is more right. likely, um, and put a lot of stress on that, and it's, and it's already starting to happen. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to watch the Italian debate. First of all, you have to not know what's going on to right. fundamentally actually believe what somebody's saying. So you're focused on the budget deficit, but the GDP assumptions that are on that deficit right. are completely wrong to begin yeah. with. So why are we even talking about this ratio 
against the wrong number. Right. I mean, you literally look at the Italian GDP forecast, it's one and a half, one and a half, one and a half for the next right. three years. That's what Madoff had for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Those are Madoff's yeah, right. monthly returns. Yeah. Yeah. Today's industrial month, production right. number in, you know, which is a pretty big number in an economic data series in right. Italy, was negative 0.8% or almost negative 0.1. Right. Not plus one and a half, plus one and a half, plus one and a half. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is actually, this is why I'm so focused on getting the rate of change of growth right. Right. I mean, it's actually quite peculiar for me to be have ridden a bull market in mm -hmm. equities, yep. uh, but it was also quite peculiar to have tax reform and a globally synchronized recovery and the biggest ch the stimulus in the history of China. Right. I mean, those things all happened at the same time. Yeah. Now, you're right about that, although the globally synchronized recovery lasted for about six months. Yeah. The, the IMF had a good, for, yeah. for once they had a decent forecast. It was the first time they <laughs> took up their was, numbers. Yeah. Now they've taken them down twice this year, Yeah. And yesterday as well. Right, and they'll have to, they're still high, but you know, they'll, <laughs> Way they'll, too they'll, high. they'll get there. They'll, Way too high. They'll get there. Um, somebody asked me about the uh, the IMF forecast, and uh, uh, they're always playing catch up. I said, like, I don't care if they're late. My problem is they're always wrong, <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's 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 a good thing. Good thing to know. But the you know our our kind of macro topic today is what I call the slow motion train wreck, and and here's my point. I can do this succinctly, and then we can kind of flesh it out. So a lot of people woke up on September 15, 2008, like, oh my goodness, Lehman Brothers is bankrupt. You know, sell everything, liquidate, and all that. Um, that was 15 months in the making. You could see that, well, you could see it coming 10 years earlier, but you could easily yeah, see it coming no, 15 sure. months earlier. And I, to me, it was sort of like watching a movie I'd seen before, because you know, I lived at uh, the front row seat for long-term capital management, I negotiated that bailout, and that's another one. You know, um, September 21st, uh, you know, Ron Sand is banging on my door or whatever. And uh, you know, long-term capital management is going out of business. Yeah, but that started in, June 1997. <laughs> yeah. Now, it came to a head in September 1998. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that started in June 1997 with the Thai, with Thailand breaking the peg between the Thai bot and the US dollar, spread to Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, South Korea. Um, there was literally blood in the streets. You know, the old saying, you should be a buyer when there's blood in the streets. Well, there was people were getting killed in mm -hmm. riots. Um, calmed down a little bit in the winter and then sprang up again in the spring of uh, 1998, mm -hmm. and then came to a head with Russia, and everyone's like, oh my goodness, Russia defaults, Brazil's gonna be next, and no one realized there was a hedge fund in there, it was like a country-sized balance sheet, and it was, was long-term capital management. But my point being, um, that's a liquidity crisis that played out over 15 months. 2008 was a liquidity crisis that played out over 15 months. Interesting. And people have very short attention spans. Yes. Like call me when uh, you know uh, some some major bank is bankrupt. It's happening now. Mm -hmm. It's 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 starting in emerging markets as it did. You know, it's never the same twice. So 98 started in emerging markets. 2007 started in mortgage markets, but it the contagion takes it worldwide. Now it's starting in emerging yep. markets again. And you, you know, Turkey has uh, approximately 400 billion dollars of dollar denominated external debt and no dollars. I mean, their reserve position is draining down. Um, the, they're not the only ones. Yeah, well, they're not the only ones, you're right. <laughs> and that's that's the point. There's a lot of dry tender around, you just need to match in one place. So I'm looking at this, I'm like, all right, U.S. is kind of going broke slowly. Uh, there's dry tender all over the emerging markets. Uh, there's a dollar shortage abroad. Mm -hmm. Now, plenty, people don't understand that. Right. Especially, I mean, I mean, you have a lot of people that follow you that I'm certain don't understand that because some people came into this year ragingly bearish on, they'll say, okay, debt deficit, Trump, if I don't like that last T, dollar back. Right, right. But the dollar shortage, they don't get it. Yeah. And this happened, of course, this happened in 2008 in a slightly different form. So everyone was like, it was one fire after another in the Fed and the FDIC and the OCC and they're running around putting out all these fires. But when there was a run on the U.S. banks, Bernanke goes, no problem, you're all guaranteed. They, you're guaranteeing every deposit in America. Forget the 250000 Financing secured. Yeah, cabinet, yeah uh, and I'll, t I'll tell you a little story about, uh, I had a conversation with Geithner about the, uh, what they're going to do the next time. But anyway, um, guarantee all the bank deposits. Uh, money market funds, you're all guaranteed. Uh, General Electric, commercial paper, guaranteed, done. You know? So they were running around putting all these guarantees on things, trying to put out the fire. But the real problem was in Europe. Because who bought all the the money market funds, who bought all the commercial paper was the European banks. Mm -hmm. So they had dollar assets and they had, they were funding it in, in, in dollars to the extent they could. Well, when the dollar deposits dried up, they had to roll over dollar assets, but they had no dollar liabilities. Mm -hmm. And the European Central Bank doesn't print dollars. They couldn't turn to their own central bank. 
So they were all going to go out of business, basically, you know, starting with Deutsche Bank and UBS and, and Barclays and one after the other. So what did they do? And this was the biggest play that was completely unknown at the time. It only came out years later after Dodd-Frank when they required some disclosure. But the Fed printed $10 trillion of, uh, of US dollars. Mm -hmm. And the ECB printed the equivalent 10 trillion euros. And they swapped them. Mm -hmm. They did a currency swap. So now the ECB had dollars, courtesy of the Fed, which they handed out to their banks. And that's how they propped up their banks. But they became the dollar funder to, to the European banks. So that was the case where if you're outside the United States and you're not in the Fed you know, too big to fail list or the FDIC insured list, uh, and you have dollar assets that are going bad, and, you, and you're funding with dollar liabilities that are drying up, you're out of business. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and did they do that for the ECB at the time? Yeah. Would they do it for China? I doubt it, and not now. Um, not, nobody in Africa, nobody in South Asia. Those dollar uh, swaps are not available by mm -hmm. and large. So, uh, so it could be a lot worse. Mm. That's, uh, you know, because most of these, as you know, global macro crises are perpetuated by dollar shortages and flights actually back to the world's reserve currency because right. you're flying out of Argentine pesos, right. South African rands, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, to me, I mean, this looks pretty clear on that front. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is just an update on, on, on uh, Trip and Salama. Trip and Salama says, if you are the global reserve currency, you have to run trade deficits forever yeah. because that's the only way the rest of the world can get it. They send yeah, you stuff, you give them dollars, and they use the dollars to invest in U.S. markets or make dollar loans or your dollar market or whatever. So the, the reserve currency issuer is in a, uh, a perpetual trade deficit. Mm -hmm. Now, they say, he said, but that's not sustainable in the long run. Well, he said this uh, 50 years ago, 55 years ago. But now, you know, we've got to be patient, but 55 years, the reality of Trevor's dilemma is catching up with the world. Yep. Now, here comes Trump. You know, everyone's running in his office saying, you know, Mr. President, you have to understand when you run a trade deficit, it's actually good for us because that means we have a capital inflow and we can do all these wonderful things. Trump's like, no, I just want to get rid of the trade deficit. Trump is not buying into all these sophisticated, you know, <laughs> graduate level economics courses. He's saying, no, China, 500 billion, too big. Get it down to 200 billion. Just buy some soybeans. They're like, well, we buy soybeans from Brazil. I'll buy them from us. That's Brazil's problem. Yeah. That's America first. That's that is the president's policy. So, now that's a separate debate. But that's what the president's doing. That's what Bob Lighthizer is doing. Consistently. But consistently, yeah. Lighthizer is more radical than the president, yeah. and uh, and so is Navarro. But but Lighthizer is the, the guy behind this, um, and. Uh, if you drive down the U.S. trade deficit, which is what they're trying to do, that means uh, fewer dollars available abroad. It's, just, exactly. it's exacerbating this, this crisis we just yeah, talked I mean, about. That, that is a, as well explained as anyone I've, I've heard. First of all, you don't get to hear somebody intelligent who's done the work explain it because there's a commercial. Um, <laughs> so thanks for, I guess I'll thank myself for no commercials. But we'll uh, actually get to some questions. You have tons of questions as usual. If yeah, you don't mind. Um, not at all. Because uh, maybe, maybe tying this kind of, uh, both kind of the, the way that you both approach the world on complex systems um, and chaos theory, just maybe like quick blurb based on what's going on about like kind of what you, you know, how, how you kind of, what, what's made, what's shaped this theory for you and kind of how it applies today? Uh, well, what shaped the theory is, uh, first of all, all, the theories that don't work and then, <laughs> and then the real world. So yeah. that's, that's my sequence. All the linear theories so, don't work. <laughs> uh, right, so I was at, um, at long-term capital management from start to finish. We had uh, an investment committee, 16, uh, I think 15 out of 16 had PhDs from MIT, Harvard, Yale, Chicago, Stanford, like the same five schools. They were each other's professors, uh, you know, Bob Merton, Todd, Eric Rosenfeld, et cetera. Um, and they had, a, and for, for five years, LTCM was a money machine. We actually did triple investor money in the first five years. Um, then it just collapsed catastrophically and lost uh, 90, uh, 92%. So you ended up with eight cents on the dollar. Uh, at the end of it. Uh, I wasn't the risk manager, I'm not a PhD. Um, I was the lawyer, I had to clean up the mess <laughs> or negotiate through it and clean up the mess. But when I came out of that, I was very intellectually dissatisfied. We had two Nobel Prize winners. They were the real deal, I mean, they were, they were nice guys, they really were that smart. Uh, they really did work hard at all this stuff. There was no malfeasance whatsoever. It was just catastrophically bad risk management. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to understand why. I was like, how could the smartest people in the world in an IQ sense, get it so badly wrong. And it took me about five years to do that. But the way I did it, five years to understand it, and then some years after that to develop new theories. 
But the way I did it, I didn't look at all the conventional models. I never liked them anyway. I, I hated economics in college, yeah. and I, now I know why, because most of it was wrong. <laughs> but, um, but I studied complexity theory, I studied network theory, graph theory, nonlinear physics, uh, applied mathematics, behavioral psychology. Uh, I studied a long list of things that when I looked at them, I said, first of all, this makes sense. And then when I started moving it over to capital markets, uh, I, it was like, you know, taking taking scales off your eyes. Everything was very clear. We've had very good results since then uh, in, in predictive analytics. But um, to me, it was just really funny. I got into bank complexity theory, but I was one of the pioneers in bringing it over to capital markets. Yes. Capital markets are, are, are a, a complex system non parel I have difficulty thinking of another system that uh, fits better with complexity theory. Mm -hmm. Wall Street doesn't use it. Now, why is that? One is uh, some inertia, uh, a lot of inertia actually. Two is self-interest. Like if you use complexity theory on Wall Street, you wouldn't have the leverage, you wouldn't have the profits, and you wouldn't have the bonuses that you do today. You have to mask the degree of risk that they're taking. Yeah, right. To justify With the, theory, your, the, the traditional theory. Yeah, the about what's probable. Right. Well, the, yeah. tra the traditional theory is that uh, the, the probability is low, so I'll get my you know, $100 million in bonuses in my house in Nantucket, my yeah. yacht and all that, and then I'm out of here, and then when it collapses, I'll leave it on somebody yeah. else. That's the traditional theory. If you actually use complexity theory in a risk management sense, you get very, very different results. And, you know, I, without mentioning a name, I briefed the, the private briefing closed door for the board of directors of one of the two or three largest banks in the world recently. And, uh, you know, great, nice people, really smart. I don't, I don't see any bad actors in the room. But uh, just talking about what we're talking about right now, and they, mm -hmm. they, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one guy kind of jumped out of his seat and said, thank you, thank you, I've been saying this for years, and no one's listening to me. And I said, well, I'm glad, glad I could help. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, I just want to hug you. And the, the CEO said, you know, I've, I've paid you millions of dollars, you've never offered to hug me. So all of a sudden, there were always man hugs going around. You know, but, uh, um, it's, uh, look, uh, Copernicus figured out that uh, the sun does not revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun. For a thousand years, everyone said, well, you wake up, the sun's over there, it goes over there, it goes down over there, and goes around and comes back up the next day. So clearly the sun revolves around the earth. Copernicus said no. Well, okay, and he was right. But it's not like everyone said, hey, Nick, nice job. You know, we, we got it. It took 100 years. Yeah, of course. Hey, Ty Nick. It, it, you know, <laughs> Theories are sticky. Ty Tycho yeah. Brahe and um, uh, Johannes Kepler and, of course, Copernicus and others, it took 100 years for that to sink in. Uh, we, won't be a, we won't have capital markets in 100 years if we don't you know, do it a little faster. Yeah. Uh, so that was, uh, that was my sort of intellectual journey through that. But uh, the proof's in the pudding. If you use complexity theory, and not just complexity theory, I use that, I use history. Um, so history is a great teacher, but they don't use it on Wall Street, they don't use it in central banks, because you can't quantify it. You can't quantify the financial panics of the past. Like in 1998, when we, we bailed out LTCM, our model, was the panic of 1907. Because of Glass-Steagall, there hadn't been a comparable financial panic in the entire period in between, uh, in between that time. 1907, J.P. Morgan, the, the guy, not the bank, um, got all the bankers in New York at his uh, townhouse in, uh, in Murray Hill in Manhattan, and he got them in the library and he told his servants to lock the door. And they did. And he said, he said, I'm not letting you out of here until you come up with a solution. He knew what they had to do, but they were not ponying up some fresh money uh, now, to, to Morgan's credit, they used triage. Uh, he said to uh, Ben Strong, who later became uh, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, he said, look, I want you to go through all the books of all the banks, and you got like 24 hours to do this, and break them into three categories. Those that are going to fail, no matter what we do, they're going to fail, okay? Those that are going to survive, they're strong enough to survive. And then the in-between category, where they deserve to survive, but they're on the fence. So he said, these guys are going down. These guys are writing checks, and these guys are getting bailed out. And that's what they did, and it worked. Um, but they were willing to let banks fail. As long as they could preserve the system, they didn't care how many banks failed. My, well, I have a lot of criticisms, but, but what Geither and Bernanke did in, uh, in 2008, nobody failed, except Lehman. That was the outlier. But that was because they kept sending an ambulance to Dick Fall, and he wasn't smart enough to get in. But, um, but so, so Lehman failed, and 
that was a cover up because Bernanke and Paulson to this day said we didn't have the government authority to bail them out, which is nonsense. They, yeah. they did have the government authority. International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977 gives the president dictatorial powers in the financial crisis. They just didn't want to use it and they got it wrong. But, uh, but for all the other banks that were bailed up, they, but they could have let a few banks fail. I mean, the way to do it, you don't exactly let them fail. You nationalize them. Nationalize all the big banks. Strip out the bad assets, put them in a trust for the American people, you know, 10, 15 year workout, whatever. Uh, equity goes to zero. Bondholders take a 20, 30% haircut, whatever they need to fill up the hole in the balance sheet. And then six months later, your IPO will clean bank. We would have been rocking and rolling by, by 2009. Yeah, that's uh, but that's not what they did because of cronyism and a lot of other. A lot of other impediments. A lot of people don't get paid in this scenario. Just exactly. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> they go to work for the banks yeah. they, 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 when they leave government. Right. All right. Let's go to. Um, we kind of talked about this debt to G, the debt, debt to GDP ratio r ratios around the world. Do you have any comments on Australia's private debt to GDP? I um, mean, Australia's big four banks with sixty five percent of their book uh, in Aussie property. Yeah, look, the, the, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, has the capacity to, they have their own little version of too big to fail. Um, I, uh, th the problem with Australia, they're, they're just, they're joined to the hip of China. China slows down, they slow down, it's as simple yeah. as that. Now, they, they have the longest economic expansion, maybe. Yeah, they've been in a recession like 20 something years. 26 years, yeah. exactly, so nice, nice job. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they could be, and I'm not predicting recession for Australia, but I am predicting a slowdown. Uh, I've recommended uh, you know position short short the Australian dollar. That's actually working out very well right now. Um, so I don't see. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, property prices are coming down. They're starting to collapse because you know I, I travel in Australia quite a bit, and uh, they say they, you know the joke is the national bird of Australia is the crane because you look at the skyline, yeah. there are cranes <laughs> yeah. putting up. And you know, so I'm in Melbourne or Sydney or Adelaide or whatever, and I I say to people, I say, who's buying all these apartments? And they go, it's the Chinese. You know, and that was true until about a year and a half ago. And that money, dry, see, at the end of 2016, China closed the capital account. That's, that's Mundell Fleming 101. In other words, you can't, you can't have um, an independent monetary policy, a fixed exchange rate, and an open capital account. You cannot have all three. You can have two out of three. Uh, you can break the peg. You can uh, not have an independent monetary policy, or you can close the capital account, but you can't have all three of those things. And so watching China in 2016 was interesting because everyone's like, well, they got $4 trillion in reserves. Yeah, but by the end of 2016, they had $3 trillion of reserves. They lost a trillion dollars of reserves in, uh, in 2016. Um, and they were losing at one point at the rate of $80 billion a month. And everyone's like, well, they got $3 trillion left. No, because of the $3 trillion that remained, $1 trillion uh, they allocated to, uh, to private equity and hedge funds. You know, try getting your money back from Henry Kravis, so you won't, won't be fast. Uh, so it, it was a good asset. I'm not saying the wealth wasn't there, but it wasn't liquid. It was in, it was in alternative investments. Another trillion had to be kept as a precautionary reserve to bail out the banks. Everyone said they can bail out the banks. Yes, they can, but it's going to take a trillion dollars to do it. So you need to keep that on the shelf. So they really only had one trillion to defend the currency. And at the rate of $80 billion a month, which was the, the outflow at the time, they were going to be broken one year. So I said, well, China's going to be broken one year. Everyone's like, you're crazy, whatever. So I didn't do the math. But I knew that that wouldn't happen. So something else was going to happen, either a maxi devaluation. Well, they just had two of those in 2015. And we caused the US stock market to go down 11% both times. So at the, uh, the Shanghai Accord in February 2016, it was like, don't do that. Don't, you're, <laughs> you're tampering with the primal forces. So, um, and, and they did want an independent monetary policy because they, they want to raise interest rates because they would cause unemployment in China, which is destabilizing. So if you take, um, and if you take a, a higher rates off the table and you take a devaluation off the table, you only have one choice, which is to close the capital account. And that's what they did. So they've, they've held on to the $3 trillion since then. But now it's like, well, now what do you do? Yeah. What's your next act? Your yeah. foreign invest, direct foreign investment is drying up because the president, uh, president uh, Trump is pounding on U.S. corporations not to go there. Mm -hmm. So they're, China's going to crack. Um, it's going to crack sooner than later, you know, certainly sometime next year. Uh, you know, how it plays out, what, you know, corporate defaults are going up. Um, so much of the debt is state-owned enterprise lending to another state-owned enterprise. So it's like I, 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 got, I borrowed some money I can't pay back. I issue some bad paper, and I take the money and give it Move to it you. Around, yeah. Yeah, and, and so we all have 
you know, liquid-looking balance sheets, but nobody can pay anybody. Yeah. Well, that, uh, the 15-month the timeline, mm -hmm. on that timeline, will be right on time. China started slowing, even on the numbers they're making up, right. which is amazing. Yeah, the, uh, on, the, on their own made-up numbers, those numbers started slowing at the beginning of this year. Right. Their stock markets, you know, the, even the, the Hang Seng's collapsed at this point, right. you know, down 22% or whatever since January. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting, I mean, but not surprising. Anything that's directly linked to China, including you mentioned Indonesia, yeah, EM Asia, all their markets stopped going up in January. Right. Once we get to the middle of 19, right. like you'd have to be deaf, dumb, stupid, you know, completely out of sync with what's been happening to not understand that there's a major causal factor going on here that is called China slowing and them yeah. really pushing on a string at this point. Right, and I was, I was going around uh, last winter, January, February uh, 2018, saying um, the trade war is real. Yeah. It's serious. It's going to have a major impact. It's not going anywhere soon. Everyone on Wall Street is like, no, no, no. This is just the art of the deal. Trump's posturing. Chinese are posturing back because they don't want to lose face. Uh, they'll sit down and work this out. I was like, no, you don't understand. This is real. Uh, neither side's backing off. Trump's serious. Yeah. So you, you have to study Lighthouse. You have to understand how he thinks about mm -hmm. this because the president's empowering him. And, and Navarro. And Xi, Xi Jinping. Um, so he just made, uh, the last fall he made dictator for life. You know, he got a promotion to dictator for life. <laughs> <coughs> the problem with being dictator for life is you have nowhere to go but down. And that's the history of China. They, it's the history of every they, single Yeah, they all made these emperors and say, oh, you've lost the mandate of heaven, straight down. So he can't back off for political reasons. Trump will not back off for political and economic reasons. So this is going to escalate. But, um, and they've weaponized CFIUS. Now, when I mention CFIUS, people say this is itch or burn. Uh, but it's actually a uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Now, I was very involved for a long period of time with the intelligence community working on CFIUS matters. When I was doing it, we obviously we took national security seriously. But the attitude was, don't stand in the way of deals. Find a way to make it happen. Like, if you got a threatening party somewhere on the board of directors of the buyer, put in a mitigation agreement, he can't go to the meetings, or you did stuff like that. I never personally approved it, but it wasn't my call. Uh, we were there for other reasons. Um, but now Trump has weaponized it. He said, no, our, now the default position is you can't invest. You've got to prove to us that this is safe. And Huawei, forget it. Huawei can't invest anywhere hmm. close to the United States or US, um, US corporation, but it's gone it's going way beyond Huawei mm -hmm. at, at this point. Um, so China cannot diversify its reserves or increase its returns by investing in the U.S. because the U.S. won't let them. We're not investing there. See, I, I, I could see, um, this is a little bit more of a stretch, but I could see the United States nationalizing Google uh, and just turning into a utility. You know, everyone gets, you know, it's a utility. Uh, it's useful, it's, uh, I use it, you know, but uh, you can't do what you want anymore because what Google is doing is they're empowering China to populate their concentration camps. You know, when you say concentration camps, people, they're not death camps. They're con concentration means you gather up your enemies and put them in one place, and then you engage in, in thought conversion, re-education, re as they call it. Well, you gotta find those people. Well, the easiest way to find them is online, you got a camera, using facial re recognition software, very sophisticated artificial intelligence, word matching. Google is building all that for China. Mm -hmm. Because they why? Because they want to make money. Well, uh, we're now at the point where with China, it's not just about trade. It's not just about currency manipulation. This is much closer to war, stopping short of shooting. Uh, and why on earth would you let a major U.S. corporation empower the Chinese? Mm. No, you might not. And that's the, that's the point. Mm. It is. A, they couldn't have seen this coming. They couldn't. Who, Google or? No, 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 the uh, Chinese. Oh, I mean, no, I agree they, with that. They, 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 just Trump stepping on yeah. the neck yeah. with no care or deviation from his path right. or, or position. Right. I there, there's no that. If, if you're planning for the long term, they wouldn't have predicted that he'd be in power, and they certainly wouldn't have predicted that right. he would take this line and stay with it. Right. And this is where Trump is yeah. such a major disruptor, because you go back to uh, Clinton. Um, Clinton was one of the great Republican presidents uh, in American history. He, what, what were Clinton's accomplishments? NAFTA, end of welfare, and balanced budget. If that's not the Republican platform, I don't know what it is. So, <laughs> so he's a Republican. What did the Bushes do? The Bushes, and I'm, I'm not saying these are bad things, I'm just pointing them out. The Bushes signed, you know, No Child Left Behind and the Americans with Disabilities Act, which are liberal positions. Yeah. So the point is, the American people figured out there's no difference between the Bushes and the Clintons. This is just the establishment, okay? Trump is not. Trump is, Trump is the opposite. Uh, he's, uh, he's disrupting everything. And, you know, when, he, when Trump says America first, 
He means it. That's mm -hmm. the thing. It's not a slogan. He means it. Well, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, the average GDP growth rate between 83 and 89 and 1993 and 99, it's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah these two long stretches and, uh, you know, good growth. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Dollar so, was strong. Ex exactly. Yeah. It's like, uh, amazing. Uh, what else we got before we let Jim go? Maybe yeah, one maybe, more or two more? Yeah, maybe one more. Um, so what do you think about the case that's been made that a 2009 recession wasn't about subprime but a euro-dollar liquidity crisis? I don't know if either of you guys have thoughts. Um, I think both things are true. It's an example of contagion. It started out in subprime, but it doesn't matter where it starts. What matters is where it goes. Yes. And where this went was straight to Europe. We talked about this earlier. So the, the dollar liquidity, liquidity shortage in Europe was probably the most dangerous part of it, even though it started in mortgages and, and the you, swap you can and kind of that. see it coming. Yeah. So yeah, that's, uh, they did the swap to, to fix that. And I, just a quick aside, I talked to uh, uh, Geithner about this, and uh, I'm like, you know, if the, if the next crisis comes sooner than later, because the Fed's still at $4 trillion. They, they talk about, you know, the QT, and they're, they're trying to reduce it, but, you know, <laughs> mortgage prepayments have slowed down. So they didn't figure that one out. You know, that's, that's the first thing you learn in mortgage trading. <laughs> so they're, they're still kind of around $4 trillion. Okay, rates are up to two and a quarter or whatever, but uh, the research shows clearly that you have to cut rates 400 to 500 basis points to get out of a recession. So if we went into a recession tomorrow, I'm not saying we are, but if we did, you could cut rates two and a quarter, and that, that's it, you're out of bullets. QE4, oh really, you're at four trillion, you're gonna to go to eight? Well, you know, seven to Kelton say, well, why not? It, yeah, but, but I doubt it. So, um, so in other words, you can't really deal with it. And then if you get into a liquidity crisis, there's only one clean balance sheet left in the world. That's the IMF. Mm. They have a very low debt to uh, capital ratio. They have borrowing power, and they could issue SDRs. They have an SDR printing press. So they could print up a trillion SDRs, hand them out to the members, <laughs> China would buy them for dollars, you know, kind of get the whole thing going again. And I, I, so I asked Secretary Geithner what he thought about this. He goes, no, no, we tried that in August 09. I think it was the only guy in the world who noticed that they issued SDRs in August <laughs> 2009. Um, and uh, he said, it's, it's too slow, it's too clunky. And, and I, I talked to the head of the IMF about it, and he agreed with that, uh, the former head. Uh, so, so I said, what are you going to do? And he said, guarantees. Mm. In other words, they're going to run the 08 playbook again. But my rebuttal was, well, here's the difference. Let, you know, in, in 98, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, central banks bailed yeah, out Wall Street. Wall Street yeah. The next crisis, you're going to have to bail out the central banks. And so the people that you think can issue guarantees are going to be the people that they no longer trust. Mm. But you're going to have a... You're going to have a yeah, guarantee US issue. U.S. credit but, risk now. How are they going to guarantee? Correct. Correct. <laughs> how are they going to guarantee anything yeah. when they're the eye of the storm? It's so, amazing. I mean, that's well, you can see that now that you say it that way. I've never heard anybody say it that way because you're always the best at contextualizing the long time series with the patterns that repeat. Right. I mean, look what the IMF just did with Argentina. Yeah. With terms. Yeah, exactly. You know, okay, I'll seed the number. I'll wait. Oh, by the way, you don't get yeah. your money till then, and now you have to let your currency freely float. Right. By the way, everyone said that was a $50 billion loan. It wasn't. It was in SDRs. Yes. Now, now Argentina can take the SDRs, sell them to China, and get dollars because mm -hmm. they need dollars. But the IMF keeps its books, makes its loans, and collects in, in SDRs. And uh, so I have a little point of disagreement with the former secretary. But um, so I think you are going to be back to the IMF because you're going to have no choice. You know what guys told me at the beginning of this year? That, so we, we went bearish on EM. Mm -hmm. First time that I'd gone bearish on BM, EM in a while. And you go door to door, like institutional clients like you do, right. or uh, pension funds, mutual funds, et cetera. Right. And they're like, it's different this time. And I'm think, <laughs> thinking, OK, why? Well, they'd say, well, growth is different this time. The political change has happened. And the third one, which shocked me, shouldn't have in retrospect. I, I got a guy at the central, you know, he's a Harvard guy. Yeah. He's at the Central Bank of Argentina guy. And he, my cousin is the guy over in Brazil now. Right. So, and he went to uh, Princeton. And, you know, <laughs> and so we know, like, right. you don't know this, Keith. We know, we got a guy. Well, and I'm like, you got to be shitting me. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is really the reason why you feel safe? Well, for, well first of all, the Princeton Economics Department should be quarantined, like a, like a level, like a, a, a biochemical laboratory that's working on warfare. Just like, do your research and stuff, but don't let the ideas get out, because they, <laughs> yeah, I mean, who, well, who was there? You know, Bernanke and uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name of one of the former vice chairman, but all those, all those economists are, uh, are, are dangerous. Um, but, uh, but you're exactly right. Uh, but this is what we used to, what, 
they used to say long-term capital. We had 16 PhDs. We had two Nobel Prize winners. But there was a flaw, which they didn't see, which was that they all thought alike. Because they all went to one of five schools, they taught each other, right. and I, you know, you say, look, fire a couple of PhDs and bring in the receptionist and the landscaper. <laughs> you will lower the average IQ, but you'll broaden the cognitive diversity. And mm -hmm. once a year, the landscaper will think of something that you hadn't thought of, because they weren't, they were all thinking alike. And it's the same thing when you, and because yeah, half the central bank is right. They went to MIT, they went to Princeton, they learn the same stuff from the same people, and they've got the same flawed models, and they're making the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I take no, even if the guy. On a much larger org. Yeah, even if the head of the central bank called me up privately and said, Jim, don't tell anybody, here's what's going down, I would say thank you and, and immediately discount it because the guy doesn't know what he's doing. That is, uh, thank you for saying that because I felt like I was the weird guy. No, you're right. You know, it's, it's like it's. I guess we have that in common too. We're kind of we go into rooms and we're kind of the guy or the. You know, we're weird. You yeah. Know, because we're <laughs> saying it. Uh, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting if you're. I mean, that, it's almost. What's the biggest pushback? I guess you get on that. That this time it'll be the central bankers that need to be bailed out. Um, it's, that there's a they, bigger central they, bank. They, they, I say that to them. I, I, I've spoken to governors and um, you know head of monetary economics and somebody who, without being too glib, basically sits in Jay Powell's lap, and uh, they can't process it. They, they are as smart as they, when I say that to them point blank, they can't, there's no rebuttal. Yeah. They literally can't process it. Well, what do you mean, we're a central bank? How could people lose confidence in us? Mm. We can print all the money we need. We can issue all the guarantees we need. And my, I'm saying, well, what if no one believes you? What if no one has confidence yeah, in you? Yeah, the fiat system. Uh, yeah, exactly. And they, uh, they, they literally can't process it. Now the, and the academics aren't much better. I, I came out of a Los Alamos once and uh, meeting you know, these physicists and all this stuff. And, and I talked this stuff up. I said, here's what we need to do. We need a, uh, a collaboration. We need physicists, applied mathematicians, coders, lawyers, economists, uh, behavioral psychologists, um, you know, and, and others. Uh, and we need to all get in a room and crack the code. And together we can do it. And the physicists love it. Like, That's great. We're ready. Let's get some funding and do it. I say the same thing to a PhD economist. Like, what are you talking about? You have nothing to offer us. Yeah. We have it all figured out. So, like, okay. So the physicists are more open to developments in economics than the economists. That's a bad place to be. Yeah. It's, again, once again, it all gets down to who gets paid and how. Yeah. And challenges their compensation system. And right. I guess it's good for, for, for people that are of differing views when it's the right time to have differing views. So, yeah, exactly. So, so thanks for having that. And by the way, for sticking um, you know, with a very consistent process in terms of like, this is what I think the, few, the next gen will be all about. Mm -hmm. It'll be long past when we're gone. Right. They'll say, you know, who has a repeatable process? Right. Who's analyzing things with a methodology that's clear and it's data driven? And, mm -hmm. and you've done that. I mean, I think that that's a real important thing and people should, should always remember that. Yeah, well, reality is the best teacher. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Thank you for joining us, uh, Jim Rickards. And I, I'm sure you wanted him to go on and on and on. We promised to be uh, at the hour mark. So, again, thanks for joining us again today on day two.